I hope you enjoyed lunch. We're going to talk about a few things now. Um, if you weren't here last year, you might remember that I gave a talk about privacy and the dark era of privacy. Um, and, 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 and my point was that um, privacy is not dead, but it is dying. And the things that are going to happen in the next few years are amazing. And everybody should be concerned. And they happen because of the fact that we're about to connect billions and billions of new devices to the internet, and we call this trend the Internet of Things. And those devices will change the way we think about privacy because of two things that they're going to do. Number one, they, they will change the world from an always-off world, or off by default, to an always-on world, or on by default. By that I mean that our phone's camera is off unless we turn it on. But smart devices, like smart watches, are on unless we turn them off. So they will collect a lot of information all the time, that's number one. They will collect the uh, information 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But they will also create new types of information that up until recently didn't have digital representation to them, so nobody could exploit them. The Internet of Things will drive privacy mining. Privacy mining is going to be a big issue in the years to come. And that brings us to the dark future of privacy. And the message I was conveying last time, uh, in my last presentation last year, was I was combining three points. Number one is that we are, as people, we are very similar to one another. And uh, up-to-date psychological research uh, shows that people have this, uh, similar cognitive biases and heuristics. That means that our mind work exactly the same way. And when you add to that the fact that in the years to come we will have extensive privacy mining, the collection of more and more of our privacy, and you collect to that, you add to that, that we are all connected to third parties like Facebook, which allow uh, companies to um, conduct some kind of behavioral analysis. They ha are able to show us information and check how this information influenced the way we uh, behave you get one of the biggest problems that we have today, which is programmable people. The ability to change the, the way people behave through technology. And this is a very important point, this is a crucial point, because it happens today. And that's exactly what happened with the Russian interference in the US election. Uh, probably, yeah, <laughs> to some extent. The Russian used technology together with psychology to show information to people that would change the way they make decisions. That will happen probably with Brexit. That will happen, that what happened probably with the French elections. And that what happened maybe with the Israeli elections. So people talk about that all the time, about someone else interfering in the political structure, in the way of people making decisions. And you know what, it happens all the time. It happens whenever you get into a store, the way the story is structured, it is structured in a way that is aimed at making us make some decisions. The way a menu in a restaurant is designed, it is designed in a way that will make us order exactly what the restaurant wants us to order. For example, it was a well-known fact that people almost never buy the most expensive menu, uh, dish in the, in, the, in the menu. They will buy the second, the third, and the fourth. So uh, restaurants usually put the first meal, the first, the first dish in the, in the menu, uh, with a very uh, expensive price. And by doing that, they make us feel that everything else in the menu is not as expensive. Well, if there is $170 take, it it's makes sense to pay $90 for a burger. That's the way things work. And when I say it happens right now, I mean that there are actually companies that are involved with that. And that was the whole um, the whole story about uh, Cambridge Analytica. And I'm sure you're familiar with this story. But this is a screenshot from their website. And this is what they say. They say Cambridge Analytica uses data to change audience behavior. Visit our commercial and political uh, division to see how we can help. So this is a company which is engaged in changing the way people think through technology. Last, last uh, night I had a dinner uh, meeting with some brilliant, brilliant people uh, from very famous companies and we had a discussion about privacy. And apparently we talked about that, that there are some basic mistakes that people do about privacy. 
misconceptions, and I just wanted to mention those misconceptions. So we will have a more healthy discussion about privacy. Misconception one plus two is it's all about data, and I'm the owner of my data. Um, everybody talks about data, and it seems like we're talking about the fact that we have to make data private. And to some extent, the GDPR is trying to rechange, to, to, to redefine the, the structure of ownership of data. They're telling us we are the owner of our data. This is a very important step. But this is far from being enough. Because the question of ownership is a very difficult question. Let me give you an example. Let's say your girlfriend or your boyfriend talks with some of his friends on Facebook. My, let's say my girlfriend will talk with her friend on Facebook, and she will tell them that she's about to break up with me. Now, Facebook knows that I'm about to experience a breakup. This is a very sensitive information. I don't want Facebook to know that about me. And I might go there and tell them, you know, I own this information. I don't want you to know about that about me. And they will say, we didn't use your information to get into this conclusion. You cannot be the owner of this insight because we didn't use your information. The problem is not data. The problem is the insights that you get based on this data. And even if we will secure all the data in the world, and we will des uh, decide that we are the owners of this data, the insights that people could get about us using our data and using other type of uh, data sources is incredible. And it is not clear how we can claim ownership on, this, on, this, on those insights, especially if the insights is not just about us. For example, if some kind of research show that people in our building have um, higher risk of, uh, of getting uh, sick of, with some kind of disease, we might not know, want Facebook to know that about us. But this insight is not just about us, it's about other people as well. Maybe they do want Facebook to know that. The question about insights is a very important question, and it is currently not solvable. Misconception number three, that it's all about senses. People talk about senses as those things that will evaluate our privacy. Cameras, um, I think the power in this PC is, is, is off, because, yeah, cyber, 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 cyber. Um, if anyone here is able to turn on the power in this PC or connect it, to the electricity, that would be amazing. Yeah, this PC, the power is off. It's not plugged to the... I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> it's amazing. So it has this message saying that the, the electricity is off and we need to do something about it, and then it went. No, no, you have to plug it to the... So let me, let me continue the presentation. So it's about insights, it's about, um, it's about protecting data, um, and it's about the fact that regulation solves some of the problem, but not all of the problem. In RSA 2014, I gave a talk, the title of this talk was State Sponsored Spies Inside Facebook. And what I was trying to convey is that uh, uh, private companies uh, have information that is considered to be valuable considered to be valuable uh, for uh, intelligence ent entities. How do we know that? Because Edward Snowden, that used to work for the NSA, showed us that the NSA actually used the data that sits inside Facebook in order to stop terrorism attacks. The NSA, they have limitless amount of resource. They can, they can choose any source for intelligence, and they spend their time and effort on Facebook and use this information to fight terrorism? That means that the information that sits inside Facebook is valuable for intelligence entities. This is clear, right? But it also means that every other intelligence entity in the world has incentive to put their hands on the information that sits inside Facebook. So even if you will put a lot of regulation on Facebook on how they can use your data and they have to disclose this information on how they will use your data and so on and so forth, if we will have someone working inside Facebook, but this person is actually working for another government, and his goal, or his goal, is to take this information and send it to another government, this regulation will not help. 
to some extent, we are solving the easiest problem to solve. With regulation and with the discussion that we have today, we are solving the easiest problems. But the thing is that many people collect our data without anyone knowing about it. And they are using this data in many ways in order to change the way we behave and to change the way we make decisions. And in order for us to have a real good discussion about privacy, we have to, start, we have to stop talking about privacy and start talking, privacy is a too big of a word and it contains too many things together. And it's very hard to address the right problems when we're generally speaking about privacy. We have to start talking about ethics because privacy is all about context. I'll give you an example. I think I told this story last time I was here. Um, I was on interview on television and the lady interviewing me uh, and, I was, and she was asking me about the new ways of collecting information. And I told her there are new ways and then the companies like Facebook and Google and other are doing this and this and this. They are not bad companies. They are just big machines. Facebook and Google are big machines that transform privacy into profit. You put privacy on one hand, you get profit on the other hand. And again, Facebook and Google and other companies are amazing, amazing companies. They do amazingly good things to the world. But this is what we wanted as people. We don't want to pay for services. and We are willing to give our privacy. So, so privacy became the currency of the internet. Privacy is the uh, business structure of the internet. And when I was talking about those companies collecting more and more information, she asked me a question, a simple question. But then and there, on television, I was stumped. I was looking at the camera, and I didn't have any answers. Thank you so much. And the simple question that she asked me was, so what? And, and, and it's amazing that I didn't have an answer for this question. So what if those companies connect more and more of our data? So what? What is the problem? And it's very hard to explain privacy in 10 seconds and why privacy is important. There are so many people in the world right now that says we want our privacy back, but when you ask them why, they are not sure why. So we have to understand what is privacy. And I'll give you just a very short thought experiment to conclude my presentation. Um, you go with your, I will tell it as a, as a guy, but you can translate it to a girl if you're a girl or, or whatever. Um, you go to the beach with your girlfriend and you're taking some pictures of you on the beach, uh, very common pictures, your legs towards the sea, the bottle of beer on the sand, uh, you eating grapes or whatever. And you're taking all of those pictures and you put them on Facebook and you feel okay with that because everyone is doing that. And then you get to the, your office the next day and you see that one of your friends actually printed one of those pictures of your girlfriend and publish it, and publish it on the internet. Oh, sorry, and printed it and, and stuck it on his wall. And you look at him and say, why do you have my girlfriend's picture on your wall? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. And I, and I will go and say, I'm not sure why, why, what you don't understand. I ask, why do you have my girlfriend's picture on the, on the wall? And he said, well, you published those pictures on Facebook because you thought people will enjoy watching them. I actually enjoyed watching it, so I just printed it and I wanted to keep on seeing it. And you tell him, well, I, I, I don't want you to, to print pictures from my Facebook. Don't do that. And he says, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't made, mean to make you angry. And he takes off the picture and he throw it away. The next day you get to the office. You enter to this guy's office and you see that instead of printing your girlfriend's picture, he just created a shortcut on his desktop that when you double click it, you get to her picture. Now you're, you're really angry and you don't, come on, we just had this conversation last, yesterday. Why do you have my girlfriend picture and why do you have this shortcut? And he says, sorry, but now I'm really confused. I didn't touch this, this picture. It's on your Facebook. You put this picture there because you wanted people to watch it, right? So I'm watching it. I'm just going, I have this double click here. And, 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 and you feel that something is wrong, but you're not sure why. You feel that it was okay to publish those pictures, but it is not okay that people watch them. The next day you get to the office, you're already angry. You know why? Because you know that examples comes in threes. And then you get to this guy's office and you, tell, and you see that he is not watching on your girlfriend's picture. He's on your Facebook watching your pictures. Now you're feeling that this guy is violating your privacy. He's going into your life. You're getting angry. You're doing the worst 
thing you can ever do to another person. You block them on Facebook. <laughs> this is it. End of relationship. Now, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Because on one hand, you feel that you did what everyone else is doing, and you published those pictures, like everyone else is doing. On the other hand, you feel that it's not okay that people actually watch them. Because privacy is all about context. It is okay that people watch those pictures together. It is not okay that they focus on one picture. It is okay that they watch those pictures while they scroll down. It is not okay that they study each and every picture. It is okay that when they think of those pictures, they just consider them as pictures on the beach. It is not okay when they start analyzing what's going on there and then getting insights on those pictures, telling you things about how much you like or don't like your girlfriend, how much uh, you, you have fun or not having fun on the beach or something like that. Privacy is all about context. This is why it's very elusive. This is why it's very, very hard to have a discussion about that. So let me just conclude by saying that trust is something that we can only create together. We have to work together to make sure the world is becoming more trusted. And this is not a competition, this is a boat. We are all in this boat together. If you want to follow me, I send um, a newsletter every week with a short summary of, uh, of the past week on cybersecurity. You can go on many.blog.